everyone. Welcome to Douglas Week. We're just going to wait one minute so that everyone can take a virtual seat. Just waiting for people to come in. Happy Douglas Week, everyone. Glad to have you with us today. Happy Douglas Week. Welcome, everyone. We'll just wait a small minute to see that everyone makes it into the virtual Zoom room here. So, yeah. Well, we'll give it a start. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Caroline Schroeder. I'm one of the core organizers of Douglas Week. I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tim Gronland and Dr. Adrian Mulligan. Um, it's, uh, it's a delight to be here with all of you. We are very happy to welcome you to Douglas Week um, and to celebrate Frederick Douglass and everything that he stands for. Um, in this week, during this week. And um, we also are very happy to welcome Dr. Lawrence Fenton and Dr. Adrian Mulligan to the event today. Um, but before we begin our event, um, we wanna just uh, share some housekeeping with you. So one, um, the uh, talk and this um, event will be about 45 to an hour. Um, we have uh, a little Q&A box in the bottom. So if you have any questions, you can pop them in uh, in the little Q&A box. Um, myself and the team, we will be uh, monitoring um, the, the questions and answers and we'll, we'll send them on to the panelists and the speakers so that they uh, will receive them and then can answer them. Um, just for your information, as I said, you know, we're live on YouTube. So hello to our viewers on YouTube and um, this session will be recorded. So it will be available after Douglas Week um, once we've uploaded it to the YouTube channel. And without further ado, uh, I would like to now hand over to Dr. Adrian Mulligan from Bucknell University. He's also a uh, co-organizer of Douglas Week. He has been incredibly helpful and supportive as has uh, uh, the same with Lawrence. And so I'm very happy to be in the virtual room with you guys here. And over to you, Adrian. Welcome both. Lovely. Thank you, Caroline. So Dr. Lawrence Fenton, uh, studied history and archaeology at University College Cork um, and is now a writer and editor who lives in the city. Um, he's had his short stories published in various journals and newspapers and has also written some wonderful books, namely The Young Ireland Rebellion and Limerick, Palmerston and the Times, Foreign Policy, the Press and Public Opinion in Mid-Victorian Britain, and most recently, some publications exploring Frederick Douglass's visits to the United Kingdom and Ireland, such as Frederick Douglass in Ireland, The Black O'Connell, and I Was Transformed, Frederick Douglass, an American Slave in Victorian Britain. Dr. Fenton is also, by the way, this week's guest on the Rebel Matters uh, podcast, too. So without further ado, therefore, I'd like to introduce you today to Dr. Lawrence Fenton, whose talk is titled, Kaid My to the Stranger, Poems celebrating Frederick Douglass's 1845 to 7 tour of Britain and Ireland. All yours, Lance. Hi, thanks, Adrian, and um, good to see you at last. And um, yeah, uh, echo Carolyn's comments. Thanks for all the help that you've been giving. Um, this talk, uh, well, I guess we'll begin with you know, kind of the uh, one of the lovely things about researching are the, um, the happy accidents, the things you find that you're not expecting to find. And um, I guess that was the case with looking for speeches and advertisements for Douglas during my research for the two books. I started to come across a kind of a small selection of poems and songs that were written to kind of commemorate various aspects of his visit. Um, I collected a few of these in the appendix to my second book, but um, the appendix is often where knowledge and information goes to die. So I've been kind of, They've been in my head wondering what I could do with them and um, Doug this week luckily has given me the spur to try and bring them together in something a bit more coherent and meaningful and um, so that's the that's the plan with this talk it's kind of a, a first draft so uh, any comments afterwards will be uh, yeah very gratefully received. Um, I'll start well, as I think any work on Douglas for the next 10 or 15 years is going to have to start with uh, David Blight's uh, massive mammoth Pulitzer Prize winning biography that was out a couple of years ago. Uh, Professor Blight actually ended that book with a poem by Robert Hayden called Frederick Douglass. Um, I'll put that up here if I can. Uh, 
and um, I'll give it a read. Robert Hayden was the first African-American poet laureate in America. <clears throat> when it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing needful to man as air, usable as the earth, when it belongs at last to our children, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, when it is more than the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro, beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien. This man, superb in love and logic, this man shall be remembered. Oh, not with statues rhetoric, not with legends and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of his life, the lives fleshing his dream of the needful, beautiful thing. Um, that poem was written in 1947, roughly 50 years after Douglas died. Uh, <clears throat> the poems that I'm more interested in now for this talk were written about 50 years before he died, um, in the 1845, 1847, during his tour of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, forced to flee America after the publication of his incendiary autobiography, the escaped slave Douglas found himself in Ireland during the autumn and winter of 1845 as part of this larger, broader tour. I've traveled almost from the Hill of Hoth to the Giant's Causeway, and from the Giant's Causeway to Cape Clear, he wrote back to abolitionists in America lecturing on and denouncing slavery all the way. He spoke at venues large and small, still standing or lost to time, including the Music Hall in Lower Abbey Street, which is now the Abbey Theatre, the Courthouse in Cork, the Independent Chapel on Bedford Row in Limerick, which is now the Buttery Cafe, and the long since demolished Reverend Hannah's Presbyterian Meeting House on Rosemary Street in Belfast. Douglas was a tall and powerful presence, um, he wanted to raise public opinion in Britain and Ireland against the slaveholding South, or as he put it, to encircle America with a girdle of anti-slavery fire. But his speeches were as much about entertainment as education and enlightenment. Um, Douglas was well aware of this. Uh, there was a voyeuristic element, and he never failed to deliver his uh, descriptions of the brutalities inflicted upon slaves coming complete with the opportune rattling of shackles and manacles that he'd brought with him in his trunk across the Atlantic. And these drew horrified gasps from crowds throughout the country. Um, Douglas also took aim at the uh, slavery supporting Southern ministers who encouraged slaves to look down upon their hard, horny hands and muscular frames as proof that God had adapted them to physical labor. Well, their white masters who have slender frames and long delicate fingers were designed for thinking. Douglas would parody these uh, ministers to great effect with his gifts of mimicry and his uh, deep and dexterous voice coming to forth. He spread out his arms, look up at the ceiling, and in the manner, sir, or in the manner of a minister addressing the black pews, intoned, and you too, my friends, have souls of infinite value, souls that will live through endless happiness or misery in eternity. Oh, labor diligently to make your calling and election sure, or oh, receive into your souls these words of the holy apostle, Servants, be obedient unto your masters. Um, Douglas's uh, speeches were very well received. The crowds quickly went from scores to hundreds to thousands. Uh, the music hall held 3,000 people and he filled that three nights in a row. So you've got the guts of 10,000 Dubliners listening to him over a short period of time. Um, there was one occasion, however, where it seems that the reception was not quite as would have been hoped. And this happened in Waterford when Douglas was making his way down from Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, across to Cork. Um, this was in early October 1845, and the poor attendance, um, which was put down to the bad weather and to there being horse races on that evening, was um, it gave rise to kind of the first Douglas-themed poem of his stay in Cork. Uh, it was published in the Waterford Mail, and it's called To the People of Waterford Under Chilling Reception of Frederick Douglas. Shame on ye, heartless men of Waterford, who, when the slave come to your heart and home to trill your bosoms with his lightning word, doubtfully question, wherefore does he come? What unto us the woes of cat and cord, of life extinguished, or of soul held dumb? Two, give us rest in peace, our gentle ears, soothed at bland murmurs if you speak of wrong. 
we are delicate. Mayhap our exquisite tears should start if troubled by her language strong. Must Douglas shrink from truth to still your fears? Deny the cruel torture felt so long? Blind craven men, slaves, slaves in heart and brain. Your souls are dark, your minds confess the chain. Um, this also gave rise to a little bit of a tit for tat between some of the Waterford newspapers. Um, he did not come to the right place, wrote the male's rival, the Chronicle, rather self-servingly on Doug of Douglas's talk. If he had given intimation of his coming to the Chronicle office, we should have made sure the city heard of him. Um, but either, whatever the reason, his uh, talk seems to have not quite gone as well in Waterford as in other places. Um, anyway, he moved on to Cork, and as with Dublin and elsewhere, his um, speeches, they're often kind of like hours long, high energy, combustible affairs that would then finish in the traditional Irish style with people taking to the stage themselves to perform their own kind of party pieces, poems or songs. Douglas, we know, took part two and the newspapers are full of reports of him singing a song in favour of abolition or an original Yankee temperance song or a beautiful sentimental air. A number of pieces were also composed specifically to commemorate Douglas and his tour, including Cade Mila Fawlty to the Stranger, which is probably the best known of the poems from this period, and it's kind of cropped up in a few articles and newspaper pieces. Um, this was written by the Cork poet Daniel Casey, and it was sung by John Donovan after a speech of Douglas's at the St. Patrick's Temperance Hall in Cork on the evening of the 28th of October. Apparently, it was performed to the tune of Old Dan Tucker. Um, which I only know from uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Woody, um, Pete Seeger type album. Um, this piece, it's been called a poem and it's been called a song. I think basically the um, line between these two forms of, 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 of art were kind of much more fluid in the 19th century than they are today. And um, this uh, long poem, or well, not too long, this poem went, Stranger from a distant nation, we welcome thee with acclamation, and as a brother warmly greet thee, rejoiced in Erin's isle to meet thee. Then Cade me to the stranger, free from bondage, chains, and danger. Who could have heard thy hapless story of tyrants canting base and gory, whose heart throbbed not with deep pulsation for the trampled slave's emancipation? Then Cade me to the stranger, free from bondage, chains and danger. Oh, why should different hue or feature prevent the sacred laws of nature and every tie of feeling sever? The voice of nature thunders never. Then Cade me the to the stranger, free from bondage, chains and danger. Then born o'er the Atlantic waters, the cry of air and sons and daughters for freedom shall henceforth be blended till slavery's hellish reign be ended. Then Cade Milifortia to the stranger, free from bondage, chains and danger. Um, in what is perhaps a sign of the affection that Douglas had for this poem, a handwritten copy of it can still be found in his papers in the uh, Library of Congress. And um, I'll go and find that now if I can. Um, I don't know whose handwriting this is, if it's Casey, if it's Douglas, uh, I don't think it's Douglas, if it's someone else, but um, and I don't know if he took this with him from 1845 or what if it was sent subsequently, but it's um, it's nice, feels nice that it was there. Um, Daniel Casey, um, he was known as a cork wit, and um, he was close at this time to two other poets called John Fitzgerald and Thomas Condon. They'd gone to the Nortmond School together, and they stayed in Cork, and they went about their lives and their jobs, but they kept writing poetry all the time as well. They were called the, uh, the Bards of the Lee, and if anyone is joining us from further field, the Lee is the river that runs through Cork. Um, I've also discovered uh, just a few nights ago that the three of them are buried in a cemetery, which is just around the corner from me. So um, my weekend plans are sorted. I'm going looking for graves. Um, there's not much else to do uh, within the two or five mile radius that we can now travel. So it's nice to have anything to do. Um, Casey has one big collection of poems. It's called Cork Lyrics or Scraps from the Beautiful City. And it was published in 1857. Uh, that poem, Strange from a Destination, is, is part of it. 
It's called in that book to Frederick Douglass. And there's a note attached to it um, that says, the following song, which the celebrated Frederick Douglass stated was sufficient to compensate for years of slavery, may be deemed appropriate as the recent struggles for Negro emancipation have attracted such deep attention. Of course, uh, no poem is worth 20 years of slavery, but it, um, it does kind of indicate that perhaps Douglas sought out Casey on this evening and they maybe had a little chat about things together. And it also shows that Casey was still paying attention to uh, American affairs when he published his collection of poems in 1857. This was just after kind of Dred Scott and you had bleeding Kansas and Kansas, Nebraska. So um, things were getting, um, were, were, were getting uh, you know, quite dangerous in America. And uh, yeah, Casey was still paying attention. Um, another uh, note about Casey is that, you know, it seems like he realized that he'd hit upon something good uh, using Cade Miller-Falcia. Um, it seemed like the American audience uh, appreciated having the cupola fuckle thrown at them. And so a few years after Douglas's visit, a American ambassador in London, he came and he traveled over Ireland. He was in um, the lakes of Killarney, he cruised up to Shannon and he came to Cork. And so Casey has also written a, po written a poem for him. And again, it's um, it weaves in the Cain Wheel of Fortune. So um, yeah, he had found out a kind of a line. He was uh, following it. And that poem to the American ambassador is also in his book, Cork Lyrics or Scraps in a Beautiful City, which can be um, just Googled and found on archive.org or Google Books. It's um, easily, readily, readily available. Um, oh, and that song, the one for the American ambassador, it was uh, meant to be sung to the tune of Star Spangled Banner, but this was long before Star Spangled Banner uh, became the US national anthem. It was still just a kind of a popular song that had been written by F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, ancestor. Um, there's another element in Cork for the poetry. There was a lady called Mary Tucky. Uh, she was long involved in the anti-slavery movement here, and she had written many poems about anti-slavery. Uh, her book, The Wrongs of Africa, again, that's easily available on archive.org, that was written in response to George Thompson, a British abolitionist, visiting the city and making some speeches in the mid-1830s. She also wrote a poem about the... Um, the American slave, escaped slave Moses Roper, when he came and visited Ireland in 1838. Um, that poem is in Christine Keneally's um, new book, The Black Abolitionists in Ireland. And Mary Tucky, I believe she also wrote a poem about Douglas, uh, but it's tricky to track down. The members of the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society at this time, they would organized the collection of knitted articles, books, paintings that they would send to a thing called the Boston Bazaar, which was a big fundraiser for um, the American Anti-Slavery Society every December in Boston. And so after Douglas was here, they collected a, they you know brought together a collection of poems, anti-slavery poems edited by Mary Tuggy, and it was hand painted, hand bound. And it seems like there was only one copy and it was sent over to the Boston Bazaar and a couple of years ago it found its way to Duke University uh, in North Carolina. It's not digitized, it's not online, so um, I'm struggling to track it down. So if anybody has connections in Duke and they want to make use of it on my behalf, I would be, uh, I would love to find that book. It's just called uh, Mary Tucky um, Anti-Slavery Poems or Poems Against Slavery, something along those lines. Uh, so there is another Cork poem about Douglas. It's there. I'm just um, yeah working my way towards finding it. <clears throat> okay, so after Cork, Douglas travelled up to Limerick, back to Dublin, then up towards Belfast, where he spent um, most of December 1845. Again, this was a great success. He sells a lot of copies of his paper of, of his book, uh, so much so that he uh, he feels comfortable enough and rich enough to buy a nice watch, which he um, wrote about, and the watch which he. Uh, he kept it in all his life. One copy of his book, uh, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, it seems to have wound its way to um, the small town of Stranroller in Donegal, um, to the house of the postmaster there, and where also and his daughter was um, Frances Brown, who's called the Blind Poetess of Ulster. And again, uh, luckily, there's not much about Frances Brown, but a picture of her was discovered by an Australian relative just a few years ago.
Then I'll try and get out for a second. So Frances Brown, so she had been uh, blind from the 18 months old, I think it was smallpox. Um, so now it's easy to imagine she'd started writing poetry around 1841. Um, it's easy to imagine her sister coming, you know, finding this book or it being sent to her and the sister reading it to Frances Brown. And um, soon after, Frances composed a poem called The Land of the Slave, and that was soon published in uh, the Northern Whig. This poem seems to kind of focus on Douglas's early years because um, in the narrative, he kind of, um, you know, before he goes to his mass, to his, um, you know, owner's house on, what, on the White House estate, he presents, a, he presents a kind of bucolic image of his early years with his grandmother in the Tuckahoe Creek and playing, the, um, playing in the fields and stuff like that. And this poem seems to be more inspired by that, you know, those early years. Um, I won't read it all, but there's a, I'll read a few of the verses. Uh, this is the first verse um, called of, of Land of the Land of the Slave. The boy made his rest where, for ages waved on, one tree of a forest whose thousands were gone. But the soft summer airs through its foliage still played, and the wild birds rejoiced in the depth of its shade. O oh, broad was the river and lovely the scene that spread where the wilds of that forest had been. The noon lay in splendour, on field and on wave, but the boy knew it shone on the land of the slave. Um, the next bit, uh, the next verse I'll read kind of concerns Douglas's mother, who um, he didn't see much of and who, who died when he was very young. He saw the far sky like the ocean of blue and thought of the mother his infancy knew of the love that through toil and through bondage she bore and the night coming step that might seek him no more. Oh, faint was the fate of his future and dim, the hope that soul masters had granted to him. But they said that the grass had grown green in her grave and he wished her not back to the land of the slave. And then a few verses later, we get towards um, his visit to Ireland. Young lover of freedom, thy prayer was not vain, Though far was the moment that shivered thy chain. But woe for the heart to confine in the clime of its early remembrance but deserts of time. Our isle had her sorrows, the page of her years is dark with the memory of discord and tears. But she still owns the heart and the hand that would save. And we welcome thy steps from the land of the slave. Um, so that's Francis Brown's uh, poem about Douglas. Um, yeah, I like I like the image of the book finding its way from Belfast across Ulster to Donegal into um into her, into her house into into her hands um her sitting there as the sister reads narrative. Uh, Frances had been writing poems for a few just a few years at this stage, but she did go on to quite a lot of success. In 1847, she um left Stranraer and went to Edinburgh for a few years, and then she went down to London for bones of twenty years, and so she had a relatively successful career as a poet, writer, essayist, and um, etc. But she was then, you know, once she died, she's kind of forgotten about for more than a century. And it's only in the last couple of years that some historians and family members in Donegal have been kind of, you know, getting her noticed again and kind of bring her, bring her to attention again. Um, after Belfast, Douglas, went across the uh, stretch of water to Scotland. And he spent most of the next six months traveling through the country, taking in not just the big cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh, but also smaller cities like um, Aberdeen, Arbroath, Dundee, Perth and Falkirk. This whole section of his tour was just uh, suffused in poetry because uh, Douglas was an ardent admirer of both Robert Burns and Sir Walter Scott. Um, it's believed that the first book he bought when he escaped north was a collection of Robert Burns's poems and was also a strong connection with Walter Scott because he took his name, Douglas, from a character in a Walter Scott novel or, or long poem called The Lady of the Lake. Uh, the character is uh, the James Douglas or the Black Douglas, who would have been a, um, an ally of Robert Bruce, the, the Bruce. Douglas wove passages from Burns and Scott into a lot of his um, speeches in Scotland. 
and he also made a kind of a pilgrimage to Ayr, the birthplace of Robert Burns. Um, and he wrote about this in a letter to the New York Tribune. Um, he went to Ayr to the birthplace to the sad, it was called the Burns Monument. So it had already been built in 1823. So by the time Douglas is arriving there, there's already been 20 years of Burns tourists and tourism, and it's still there. So, you know, it's there's been 200 years of Burns tourism and tourists. Um, one thing that Douglas got that people who go there today won't get is that he was able to meet with Burns's last surviving sibling, a, a lady called Isabella Begg, a spirited looking woman, he said, in her 70s, who lived in a nearby cottage. He also met two of her daughters, uh, the poet's nieces, and he wrote about their jet black eyes sparking the poetic fire which illuminated the breast of their brilliant uncle. Uh, kind words were exchanged and some letters in Burns's own handwriting were passed around for the American visitor to examine, uh, the family having grown accustomed to uh, entertaining Burns loving tourists from all over the world. Caught up in the emotion of the moment, Douglas tried to uh, link their lives, uh, describing how the poor self-educated Burns had lived in the midst of a bigoted clergy who looked upon the ploughman as being little, little better than a brute before he broke loose, like the similarly self-educated Douglas escaping the bonds of slavery in America broke loose from the moorings which society had thrown around him. Um, away from this, uh, yeah, uh, Burns um, had written one or two poems, kind of anti-slavery poems, um, so that was also part of the connection that linked them. Um, away from this personal pilgrimage, uh, the Scottish element of, of Douglas's story is best known for his attacks on the Free Church of Scotland, which was a newly founded church um, it had split from the main Presbyterian church and it had um, they'd raised a lot of money from American slaveholders uh, during a fundraising campaign around 1843-1844. Um, Douglas, in all his speeches, would, you know, call on Thomas Chalmers, the leader of the church, to send back the bloodstained money, to send back the money. And these words, send back the money, were soon, soon daubed on kind of walls around Scotland. Um, they were even apparently dug into Arthur's seat, which is the hill overlooking Edinburgh. This was um, happened one morning with Douglas and two Quaker anti-slavery activists in Edinburgh, uh, Eliza and Jane Wiggum. They went up to Arthur's hill with shovels in their hands and they started digging, digging into the grass, digging into the ground. Um, it's not sure if they finished the job. But there's also just you know some suggestions that a kind of a groundskeeper, or caretaker came along and stopped them. It was all civilized, but I'm um, just making the effort, um, it's a nice scene to imagine. Um, but also these words sent back the money, they didn't just make it into, you know, signs and walls, they made it into poems and poetry and song. And there was a collection of eight poems and songs published in Edinburgh in 1846. Uh, there was a copy in the British Library, but luckily, um, Alastair Pettinger, who um, has done a lot, of, a lot of work on Douglas in Scotland, he also has all of these poems up on his website, uh, bulldozia.com. Uh, and um, I'll read a little bit from some of these uh, Scottish poems now in a moment. Uh, the first one is just called Send Back the Money. Send back the money, send it back, tis dark polluted gold. Twas wrung from human flesh and bones by agonies untold. There's not a mite in all the sum, sum, but what is stained with blood. There's not a mite in all the sum, but what is cursed of God. Send back the money, send it back, partake not in their sin, who buy and sell and trade and men the cursed gains to win. There's not a mite in all the sum, an honest man may claim. There's not a mite, but what can tell of fraud, deceit and shame. Send back the money, send it back, twill strike the fatal blow that soon or late must yet be struck upon the Negro's woe. There's not a might in all the sum, but what will prove to be as iron in the soul of him who has enslaved the free. Send back the money, send it back, tempt not the Negro's God to blast and wither Scotland's church with his avenging rod. There's not a might in all the sum, but cries to heaven aloud, for wrath and all who shield the men that trade in Negro's blood. Then send the money back again and send without delay. It may not, must not, cannot bear the light of British day. Um, uh, 
This, unfortunately, this picture is not an original. It was um, made by a group in 2018 just to commemorate the um, anti-slavery activists in Scotland at the time and to commemorate that uh, Send Back the Money campaign. Uh, just a few more poems and songs there. Um, the next one is called Oh, for good luck to our coffers. And I won't read all of this. It's uh, quite long, but there's, uh, there's, there's one nice piece. There's a <clears throat> The wordy free priest was pleased to allow that all the slaveholders were Christians now, that doctrine blessed them for what they'd paid and wished them success in their slaveholding trade. Uh, the doctor that that references is Dr. Thomas Chalmers. He was a doctor of divinity. He was the leader of the Free Church of Scotland. Uh, there's another long poem here called My Boy Tammy, and it's an imagined scene between Tammy, Thomas Chalmers, and Mother Kirk, the Presbyterian Church. It's written in a kind of colloquial Scottish style. It's like, um, it's, uh, it's tricky to read. It's like reading some Irvin Walsh sections or James Kelman novels. Um, I don't think I could properly do it justice, but I'll read one little bit. Um, I've heard a voice on Thunderborn, my boy Tammy. I've seen the fingers raised in scorn, my boy Tammy. Heaven rings with Douglas's appeal and trills my heart like burning steel and conscience racks me on the wheel. You've wronged, you've grieved your mammy. Um, so after, again, <clears throat> the bones of six months in Scotland, we're now hitting the summer of 1846. And the summer and autumn of 1846 were really quite a positive time for Douglas. He travelled around England. It was um, kind of exhilarating, successful. He considered moving over permanently. Um, he was fated as a star in London, a Negro Hercules bestriding the stage. He met philanthropists like the Cadburys and the Carlyles or the, the cars of Carlisle. Um, he was shown around the Houses of Parliament by Lords Lansdowne. He saw Peel and Disraeli and others. He stayed at the home of well-known writers. He met um, he met Hans Christian Andersen, um, but they kind of hovered around each other, but uh, couldn't really communicate to each other. Um, and Douglas has written kind of amusingly about his um, kind of interactions with Hans Christian Andersen. Um, Charles Dickens, who, Dickens, who's the big star at the stage, he wasn't in London at that time. He was in Switzerland writing Dombey and Son. But his new newspaper, the Daily News, it carried a lot of positive press coverage about Douglas and his tour. And Dickens had written about slavery uh, in his 1841 travelogue, uh, Notes on America or American Notes. And he was, we know he, he was an admirer of Douglas and of the narrative because he gifted copies of narrative to uh, many of his friends particularly when he knew that they were about to embark for America. Um, <clears throat> a highlight of this uh, part of the tour was a journey that Douglas made in August to the home of Thomas Clarkson, the um, aged abolitionist who had been behind the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. Uh, Douglas spoke of him as the lifelong friend and co-worker with Granville Sharp, William Wilberforce and Thomas Foxwell Buxton. Um, Clarkson's, Clarkson's health was uh, very poor at this time, so it meant it was just a short visit in Ipswich. And, um, but nevertheless, the kind of sense of awe was still palpable in the words Douglas later wrote um, when describing the seriously ill and practically deaf Clarkson, how he had clasped his two frail hands around one of the escaped slaves and in a tremulous voice said, God bless you, Frederick Douglas. I've given 60 years of my life to emancipation of your people, and if I had 60 years more, they should be given to the same cause. <clears throat> now, Douglas left Playford Hall, uh, the Elizabethan mansion that Clarkson shared with his wife, Catherine, just outside of Ipswich, with something of the feeling which a man takes, with which a man takes final leave of a beloved friend at the edge of the grave. Um, this sense of foreboding proved accurate as Clarkson died just a month later on the 26th of September. Clarkson died, his obituary was in the Times, and as part of the obituary, they included a poem that um, Wordsworth had written about, Clarksword, uh, about Clarkson. Um, and at the same time that this poem was reprinted in the Times, an anonymous Ipswich lady was writing her own poem about Frederick Douglass, maybe inspired either by one of his talks or by one of his, um, or by reading his speech or attending one of his speeches. And I will now find that anonymous poem. Oh, 
which is momentarily gone missing. Sorry about that. So this poem is kind of a picture perfect image of the North, um, which is not really quite true. There's, there's still plenty of racism in the North, but um, not slavery. So um, again, it's a long poem, so I'll read just a few uh, sections of it. <clears throat> New England, New England, thrice blessed and free, the poor hunted slave finds a shelter in thee. Where should blood thirsty hounds ever dare on his track? At thy strong voice, New England, the monsters fall back. Go back then, ye bloodhounds that howl on my path, and the land of New England, I'm free from your wrath. And the sons of the pilgrims may, may, my deep scars shall see, till they cry with one voice, let the bondman go free. Great God, hasten on to the glad jubilee, when our brethren in bronze shall arise and be free, and our blotted escutcheon be washed from its stains, now the scorn of the world, with three millions in chains. Oh, then shall Columbia's bright flag be unfurled, the glory of freemen, the pride of the world, while well, earth's struggling millions point hither in glee to the land of New England, the home of the free. Um, I've been able to find nothing about this anonymous Ipswich lady, uh, but her poem was published in The Liberator um, shortly after Douglas was in that part of the country. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot um, you know, a recent bit of being written about Douglas in England and Scotland and Ireland, and it's kind of forgotten that he actually spent a small bit of time also in Wales. At one point, he was up in Liverpool and just kind of popped down to Wrexham. Um, he did this in October 1846, and he stayed with uh, two sisters uh, called Sarah and Blanche Hilditch, who were longtime anti slavery activists and who would have um, contributed to the Boston Bazaar and other things like that. Um, Again, after one of these speeches, it clearly impacted one of the, the um, you know, Welsh inhabitants of Wrexham or another city. And there's a, another poem written by an L. Sabine, and she wrote to Frederick Douglass. This is a very, very long poem. It kind of, it goes back to Amerigo Vespucci. It takes in Cortes and Pizarro, takes in the conquest of the Americas, takes in the killing of the Native Americans. Um, so yeah, really decent long poem here, but I'll, I'll just skip to a few of the more kind of pertinent uh, passages. <clears throat> Baptized and ground to death, the Indian lies, his name forgotten and his race destroyed, his people gone, another race supplies, the broken ranks, fills up, fills up the empty void, the deadly void. And these are the last few verses are about when he comes to, uh, to England. Douglas, we welcome thee to England's shore, a brother free man, once a tyrant's trawl. The planter's chain shall shackle thee no more. Thy frame near tremble at the driver's call. Thy tongue, thine arm, thy foot, thy voice is free. Free is the air, the light, the mountain stream. Thrice welcome to this land of liberty. Look back on bondage as a bygone dream. Thy tongue is loosened. Loosened be the ties which held thy brethren in the western shores. Proclaim their wrongs, deny, denounce the nation's lies, where man his brother hates, his God adores. Um, I'm not a poet, I don't study poetry, I don't know if any of these poems are particularly good, but um, it's still nice that they are written, interesting that they are written, and um, interesting to kind of, you know, see the impact that Douglas had on people, uh, the immediate impact that he had on people. Um, so after his summer and autumn, uh, which a lot of it was spent with William Lloyd Garrison. He'd come over from America and the, the two of them, they travelled uh, for three months all over England and Scotland uh, with great success. So after this exhilarating summer where he had, you know, thought of, you know, moving to England permanently, came a kind of strange, depressing winter for Douglas in 1846. It's a period of, of his life that's not really investigated too much. Um, I get the sense that <clears throat> he felt both abandoned and 
felt like he was the abandoner. So he saw Garrison leave, and although he and Garrison would fall out later, it's important to know that at this time they'd had a really good, solid time together. They had enjoyed each other's company, and um, Douglas was sad to see Garrison sail back to America, especially when he had originally been meant to sail back with him on that boat. Um, but now he was staying on longer. So this was like the third or fourth time now that he would have told his wife, Anna, you know, I'm coming home from shore. It's definitely happening. And now the third or fourth time that he was saying, actually, no, it's not. So the official story is that he was staying longer because they were trying to build up a new anti-slavery organization that, you know, he was, he was proving so popular that it'd be a waste to leave now. But it also seems there might have been another element involved um, because already there had been kind of murmurs and discussions were, taught, were being made about purchasing Douglas's freedom. This idea emanated from uh, two Newcastle Quakers that he s s spent some time with in Newcastle. They were uh, the Richardsons, uh, Henry, his wife, Anna, and his sister, Ellen. Um, so as well as being, yeah, feeling abandoned, feeling the abandoner, he also had to deal with this question of being purchased. Um, he felt very difficult, awkward with it um, because it was kind of accepting, acknowledging the fact that a human being could be a vendable article, could be bought and sold. But he gave permission for it to happen. Um, and in kind of all through November and December, he kind of lies low. Um, he's in Manchester for a good bit. He gives a few speeches, but this is also the very first time where I've seen uh, notes where he was too ill and he uh, um, gave, he cancelled speeches. Um, one speech he gave, he was giving it and he stopped halfway through. So he's physically ill. He's having to deal with kind of, does a lot of um, outcrying and, con and kind of controversy about his being purchased among abolitionists. Some abolitionists are kind of, you know, complaining, saying that he shouldn't do this, um, that it kind of undermines him. Uh, Garrison supports him, interestingly. Um, another another element is that um, you know, yeah, William McFeely, one of his early biographers, has said how um, the people who were against it were, he describes them as moralists bent on purity, someone else's purity. Nevertheless, Douglas was, he was full of doubt about this process. He was sick, he was lonely, he was um, in not a great, in not a great state of state of mind during his time. But sometime around Christmas, the transaction is completed all the relevant documents are signed in Baltimore in the Baltimore Chattel office and he is purchased for 150 pounds sterling or roughly 720 dollars. Um, and Douglas so finds out that he's free when he's in, in Newcastle and um, soon after that he goes to a meeting at the Mansion House in or the Music Hall in Newcastle um, on Nelson Street on the evening of Monday the 28th of December 8th convivial gathering, it said, to celebrate Douglas's manumission, and at which the local reformer and riot E.P. Hood uh, delivered a spirited ode call, called We'll Free the Slave. And um, I'll just read one passage of this. How bright the sun of freedom burns from mount to mount to shore, from shore to shore. The slave departs, the man return, it returns, the reign of force and fraud is o'er. Tis truth's own being from sea to sea, from vale to vale, from wave to wave. Her ministers this night are we to free, to free the slave. Um, E.P. Hood, I think, is Edwin Paxton Hood, who was later a Congregationalist minister. I'm not totally 100% sure on this. Um, this Edwin Paxton Hood, he was born in London in 1820, but I do know that he moved north. He was married in York in 1847. He was also involved in the peace societies and in the temperance movement. Um, there's also newspaper reports of him giving speeches in Newcastle in 1846 and 1847 on issues like temperance and peace. And so he would seem to be the type of character who would also be involved in anti-slavery uh, movement agitation. And he went on to write many books of poetry, many biographies. So, um, you know, I think Edwin Paxton Hood is the E.P. Hood, um, but I'm not, yeah. 100% sure. Um, <clears throat> so now Douglas is free. It's the end of 1846, the start of 1847. Douglas is free. He can return to America, but he doesn't go straight away. Um, again, the story is that he's going to stay there to build up the movement. But um, I think there might be more to it than that. 
I think that his friends, the Richardsons, having collected money and, and seen how easy and quickly they collected money for his freedom, they started another fundraiser and it was to buy him a printing press so that he, that he could have when he returned to America. So he stays in England, touring around again, kind of through January, February and March. And um, then suddenly, and he's, the plan is that he'll stay until the summer. But in March, he decides, no, I'm heading home. Um, I think this was probably just because he got the word that they'd raised enough money for the printing press. And so he didn't need to be there anymore. So just before he goes, there's a grand farewell soiree in London. And um, Henry Russell, a famous singer, sings a song there. And it's also marked by the composition of a new song called The Farewell Song of Frederick Douglass. Now, this song was the music was written by Julia Griffiths and the words written by her brother, Thomas Powis Griffiths. Now, Julia Griffiths is a name that people who've read about Douglas will know. Um, she is the lady who followed him over to America after this and ended up spending some time in Rochester and there's lots of uh, questions about the, uh, their intimacy or their, the, the, the extent of their relationship. But um, for here now, she was just in the anti-slavery scene. Um, she had gotten to know him and she put her, put her musical abilities to, um, to use in composing this song. And um, I'll read a little bit of it, but we also hopefully will be able to hear it um, on, on YouTube after this. Uh, the verse really is just called, uh, goes, farewell to the free, no, <clears throat> farewell to the land of the free, farewell to the land of the brave, alas that my country should be, America, land of the slave. Um, I'll just show the, uh, the cover music for that picture, or for this song. Um, interesting picture there of Douglas. Uh, we know that he is very conscious of his image, so it seems that he must have given the nod of approval for this. It's, um, I have no idea why he's in a toga, but he is. And um, this is some of the sheet music to it. So when I was, um, when I found this, it was about 2016 or 2017, and I found it, the lyrics for the song in um, the Leicestershire Mercury or some other small uh, provincial uh, English newspaper. Um, but then in 2018, they discovered, uh, it was put on sale, uh, a collection of sheet music, and that included this, and so the University of Rochester purchased it. And now they think that they now have the only copy in America and one of only two in the world. And so to, to commemorate the 2018, the bicentenary of Douglas's birth, the University of Rochester held a, um, a kind of a concert to play this music for the first time. And I will see if we can listen to it now properly, the farewell song of Frederick Douglass. This goes on for three or four minutes. So uh, if it works, it works. If not, um, please someone tell me to just stop so we don't have to just sit in silence for three or four minutes. Oh, 
So uh, I think and hope that worked. Um, if anyone wants the full lyrics to that, they just have to Google um, Farewell Song of Frederick Douglass and Rochester and uh, the Rochester Library and the website kind of yeah, brings all that up. So I guess to conclude, uh, the men, the women who wrote these poems and songs while Douglass was touring Britain and Ireland, they, um, they weren't actually the first to celebrate him in verse. Uh, that goes to uh, maybe the Hutchinson family singers who actually traveled across the Atlantic with him in 1845. They had uh, written a song called The Fugitive Song, which was a heavily dramatized version of his escape north in early 1845. Um, a look through the pages of the Liberator or some of the other anti-slavery newspapers might also bring to light some poems about Douglas from that early period when he started to rise to kind of national attention. <clears throat> Nevertheless, whether they are Anonymous, obscure, or well-known, these uh, British and Irish writers were uh, certainly the vanguard of the uh, Douglas mythmakers. The, uh, their words and artistic creations helping insinuate the escaped slave and the story into the popular consciousness, uh, helping to raise him into that kind of rarefied, elevated plane of existence that seems above mere mortals, where he resides still. Um, his leonine visage and his powerful words inspiring generation after generation of political activists and leaders from the Ida B. Wells is of the Reconstruction Era, to the Martin Luther Kings and John Lewis's of the Civil Rights Era, to a young Barack Obama, and now to the Black Lives Matter protesters. He's also, at the same time, inspired poets uh, throughout the years, from uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Webb Dubois, who wrote soon after him, and also later on to Robert Hayden, who recorded at the start, and then later on Langston Hughes. And, um, now, having learned something about the Irish poets who uh, celebrated Douglas 175 or so years ago, I'm looking forward to tonight's uh, event where we'll hear a new generation celebrate Douglas in verse. And uh, in particular, looking forward to hearing Roger Gwenver Smith recite the uh, award or the, uh, the winning entry from the uh, Douglas Week uh, Poetry Competition. And uh, yeah, I think that's me. That's it. That's done. Okay, Lawrence, can you hear me? Fantastic. Um, I'm gonna get on the big screen here in a second, probably in chat, chat with you. So the uh, 
please contribute some questions. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A yet, and I know we've got some participants here, so please do. I'm monitoring the Q&A, so um, I will shut up at some point here and convey your questions to, uh, to Lawrence as they come in. So please do type some questions into that Q&A if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Fenton with regard to his talk. So my notes here kind of begin right at the beginning with, with Robert Hayden, um, where you started. And I was sort of struck in that poem how he's sort of talking about more than Douglas himself. I mean, he's talking about this, this, this larger struggle um, when he says, you know, when it is finally ours, this freedom needful to man as heir, that it's been, you know, the memory of Douglas will be honored, not with legends and poems, but with the lives grown out of his life. And obviously there's, you know, it's, it's obvious, but sort of struck by the fact that we're not there yet, you know, that we've come so far and it's good to acknowledge how far we've come. But as you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, as you think about sort of issues of race, you know, not just in the United States, but also in Ireland. And if you extend it, obviously, to issues of, of, of discrimination along lines of gender or sexuality or ethnicity, um, this, this fight here for equal rights and respects and, and justice is still going, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's uh, going and uh, ongoing. And, um, uh, well, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll never get old. It'll all, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I find myself, I, I am a professor and I teach this stuff and I often find myself at, at these sorts of moments having to check my privilege, so to speak, at the door and point out that, you know, here I am, a, a, a white man talking about this stuff that, you know, I've, I've worked hard in, in my life to get to where I am, um, but doors haven't been shut in my face uh, you know, by virtue of my, my skin color or my gender um, or my sexuality. Um, and so reading Hayden there, you begin to think to yourself, you know, we've still got some road to still keep going down in, in, in different ways. And Douglas obviously inspires us to think about that stuff. Uh, he does, yeah. Um, so one thing about Hayden, he was the first US poet laureate and uh, sorry, just brought it brought, brought into my mind. Um, uh, the youth laureate who um, you know did so uh, you know like stole all the attention did so well at the inauguration. So I'm sure if she hasn't already, she'll um, join the canon. You know, have have a Douglas poem and uh, add that to the canon of of Douglas literature. Uh, yeah, no, it's and um, it's good. You know, poetry still has a place in the world, and it's um, something like that Robert Hayden poem. It can get to the heart of things very quickly very smoothly instead of, you know, like newspaper articles, conferences, you know, like um, it just um, hits you, it hits home really quickly, really strongly. And um, that's one of the, the joys of good poetry. Um, as I said, not, I'm not sure all of the poems that were in, the, in this talk were necessarily good poems, but um, yeah, when it's, when it's done well, it hits home. Good. No, I'm not a, a poetry expert either by any means. Sort of moving on here, I was thinking about the Daniel Casey poem and that final sort of verse when he says you know then born o'er the atlantic waters the cry of Aaron's sons and daughters for freedom shall henceforth be blended till slavery's hellish reign be ended when I mean, he's talking about the cry of Aaron's sons and daughters for freedom but I think that he's not talking about Irish freedom from colonialism there, Casey, right? Casey, is Casey oh. going in that, because that's something obviously with Douglas, that Douglas had, he, there's some dalliance there occasionally, but he also obviously stayed clear of, of Irish independence. Yeah. You know, you see him when he's with the temperance crowd in Cork and the more Catholic audience, you see him go there. A little bit more. So when Casey was saying that, likely to a Protestant sort of maybe evangelical audience, does that hint at more nuanced in terms of, of, of Protestants in Cork and, and their alignment with things? Or 
Am I reading that wrong? Is this more? No, I, I, I would read it as he's calling on the Irish in America to uh, join with the abolitionists, which had been a kind of an ongoing thing. Daniel O'Connell and Father Matthew had both kind of signed this big document in 1841. Um, there was an uh, O'Connell uh, with his repeal movement. He was being asked by Americans, Irish Americans, to kind of you know, like tone down the anti-slavery rhetoric that it was harming the repeal movement in mm-hmm. in America. So I think it's more on that angle. Um, he, it, it failed. Um, Aaron's sons and daughters did not, um, you know, blend their voices with uh, their African American um, neighbors in in America. So um, those hopes of Father Matthew, of Douglas, uh, or, or of O'Connell and of Daniel Casey, they uh, they came to naught really for the most part, um, unfortunately. On the other thing, and Douglas and Irish freedom, yeah, he was. Um, he was, he was an Anglophile, that's how I see it. Uh, Britain had emancipated their slaves in 1833. And to a large degree, Britain could do no wrong in his mind. So even as he walked through a poverty-wracked Ireland, I don't think he consciously put A and B together, you know. Um, and he just, uh, yeah, he was, um, and, you know, a lot of his time was spent in slightly Protestant circles in Ireland as well. So... I don't think he, you know, later on he said a few things about home rule and he was positive, but on the whole, he uh, never really, you know, had that equation, you know, um, you know, Irish poverty, British imperialism, colonialism, he, he never really brought all that together. He was, um, yeah, an Anglophile. Yeah, and that's interesting too. We see that in the 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 uh, the, the, the song there that you played at the end that they sort of, she sort of channels Douglas there in terms of that counterposing of, of, of England being the land of the free and America being the land of the slave, which is obviously something that Douglas had, had talked about repeatedly. Just yeah, it's like monarchical freedom and, uh, yeah. 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 Democratic really slavery, America. monarchical freedom. Absolutely, you know. Um, yeah, okay. We've got some questions coming in, which is fantastic. So let's see. We have, um, first one here that comes in, um, is this one here is from Bart Bambury, who says, um, what is the graveyard referred to where Casey is buried? Um, I think it's called St. Joseph's. It's basically, you'll, you'll know it as the one, um, it's the Father Matthew graveyard. Um, it's here near kind of Ballyfehan, Tory Top, Turner's Cross area. Um, it used to be botanical gardens. Uh, Father Matthew kind of organized, fundraised, uh, took it over kind of in the early 1840s. So it was a little element of it is a kind of a famine graveyard. Then there was a nice big Father Matthew grave in the middle. Um, then there was some other graves around and then it kind of, you know, does a, you know, the more modern uh, elements of it. Um, yeah, no, it's a big one. It's um, a good place for a, for a wander. And it's, uh, yeah, close to me. So I've gone, I've got, you know, with the um, lockdown, sometimes you'll go anywhere for a walk. So I've been there a few times and now I have a reason to go back there. Very good. We have another question here from Deirdre O'Connor, who asks, I'm curious about the level of awareness of Douglas's time in Ireland and of the abolition movement in general among the rural poor, for example, in Connemara. Would such folks have had access to information about these issues? I would say probably largely not. And um, even in the big cities, uh, say in Dublin, Richard Webb, the Quaker who who Douglas stayed with at the start, he always said that a lot of their anti-slavery lectures were attended by he called them the ragamuffins, the uh, the poor rural uh, or the poor working class dubs, and he said that they came to the talks not to learn about slavery or anti-slavery, they came just to pick up some information about America because it was in their heads that you know I might end up there. So it was just kind of fact finding missions. It wasn't to, you know, it wasn't to you know learn anything from a moral perspective. It was just to kind of you know get some A's and B's and some knowledge about America because it was just yeah it's in their head as a potential destination. Something there as well I picked up on was was the mention of a printing press there at the end. I didn't know that. And I, I'm always sort of thinking to myself here sort of a social media or the Facebook of the day, we sort of, we, we forget how powerful and, and revolutionary printing presses were in terms of being able to reach massive numbers of people, being able to control your message as well, I suppose, without having to rely on journalists as middlemen. Um, and it's interesting, it sort of comes because folks like Webb have a printing press and then 
there's that fundraising for the printing press at the end. And I imagine, did that machine wind up in Rochester eventually with like yeah, a North Star? Yeah, yeah, that's the one that he used to set up the North Star. Um, so yeah, it was putting the message. He had, you know, gotten such a sense of, you know, like command of his, of his own self uh, in Britain and Ireland that he wasn't going to go back to just being a lecturer for the Garrisonians. Mm. He was going to go back and, you know, lead his own movement, which is kind of what happened. And the printing press was an essential element of that because it got his, it was a, you know, a black newspaper and it got his message and it got it to homes across the country. And um, yeah, there was, you know, there was no white middle man uh, involved in it. So it's usually just, you know, those extra few months, if that's what it was, if it is what I think it was that he stayed there those extra few months, just to keep his, his face in the news, keep the money, you know, keep make it easier to fundraise, um, it paid dividends, you know, it meant he stayed there three or four months longer, but it paid mm-hmm. dividends because he had the printing press when he went home and could, yeah, just go his own way, wasn't beholden to anybody. I'm sort of struck here because I'm, I'm a geographer, so I'm always thinking about places and the importance of, of place. So here, thinking about, you know, why Ireland, why England, what was it about these places that drew him in? But then also thinking, too, about how places are networked and interconnected to each other. And sort of thinking about the printing press where, you know, the Atlantic world and a little bit beyond that, we have all these networks and all these interconnections. And, you know, we tend to sort of view our national history in very sort of myopic sort of packaged ways, but this history sort of explodes that, right? You think of Cork, you think of other cities, interconnected every which way, interconnected through trade, through emigration, through capitalism, but then you've got this, these abolitionist pulses through this, obviously, not just sending loads of letters and clothing that were you know, raised in bazaars that were being sold back in the US, but then you've also got you've got folks like Douglas and abolitionists moving through these networks too, and also big printing presses as well traveling through these networks. You know, it's just sort of crazy to think of I mean, ships and, and, and us can interconnect every which way in the past in ways that we tend to forget about today. I mean, today we're like, okay, we're globalized every which way, but you tend to forget in the past, we were also quite interconnected. Yeah, it might've been, you know, slow and more cumbersome but it was there mm. and um like all of those newspapers all the anti-slavery newspapers in america they'd you know they'd go from boston to liverpool then to dublin and you know there'd be these hubs whether it was web in dublin the jennings is in cork the whoever in newcastle and bristol so they'd get like a big chunk of newspapers and they would dispense it among the the more local and then someone else then might dispense it further so um there were there was a uh, yeah the tentacles did reach over us so yeah slower and more cumbersome than today but definitely definitely there Good. No more questions oh. coming in. I've got a final question for you, Lawrence. So my final question here is, I was doing a little bit of homework there last night when I saw your, your slides. I was like, oh my God, I'm doing poetry tomorrow. I better, I better get my game on. At the end there, people were successful. So with the final um, song that you played there, and it was the, the final sort of farewell to Douglas um, when, he left, when he left England, People have suggested that with the, you know, there's words there at the end about, you know, being a coward, should he join the fight, the battle is raging, uh, we've got weapons being wielded. Um, people have suggested that all this talk of warfare and battles and weapons sort of foreshadows the civil war, perhaps. I read that and I thought it might be sort of too much of a teleological reading, but it, it might be more sort of common of, Protestant evangelical poetry and song that there's lots of battles raging right and there's lots of weapons do you think that they're they're going in that direction there that there's some feeling I think it's I think it's reasonable and also you know like she's probably uh Julia has probably you know spoken to Douglas about these things so um Douglas himself wrote some poems and his most uh famous one is probably the Tyrant's Jubilee it was written in 1857 um, just before, just after the Dred Scott. And so this was a, an open call to arms. Um, you know, I, I, I feel that although Douglas was, when he was with the American Anti-Slavery Society, he was supposed to be, you know, like peaceful protest, nonviolent. I don't think he ever really subscribed to that too wholly. Mm. I think growing up, you know, he's always described one of the pivotal moments of his life was 
fighting back against um that farmer in I'm forgetting his name that farmer in the um, rural um when he's working farm in r- rural Maryland yep. you know yeah. physically fighting back he he fought back when he's attacked on the docks in Baltimore mm-hmm. he fought back when uh, racist mobs interrupted his anti-slavery speech in Pendleton in Indiana and mm-hmm. he busted his hand in that fight and he was never able to write properly again and you know some people who study handwriting and see the difference that you know like it's he struggled with his handwriting all, all after that I think his kind of commitment to non-violence was tactical when he was with the Garrisonians. I don't think he, he ever felt it as deeply as, say, O'Connell did. Um, mm-hmm. Even though it seemed as something that linked him, I don't think it really did. And so, yeah, maybe it's just um, in the song, it might be just a bit of literary flourish. But it's interesting. It might be more because she would have spoken to him and in years to come, he would write in a very similar fashion in his own poem, The Tyrant's Jubilee. And this is, mm-hmm. yeah, so again, this, you know, this, that came out 1857. So Dred Scott and then leading on to John Brown and all of that. So, um, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, Thank you so much, Lawrence. I think that's, that's, that, that's it for today. We ran over a little bit, but that, that's totally cool. Thank you folks for, for your questions. Thank you so much, Lawrence. That was really sort of informative and, and interesting and everything else. Thank you to Tim here behind the scenes, Douglas Week member, um, keeping this ship afloat. So we're going to sign off here. Take care, everybody. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.